biologist who is masquerading as an executive director of a small nonprofit on the vineyard who is, uh, and we are a Great Pond Foundation dedicated to preserving and protecting Egertown Great Pond and the water resources here on the vineyard. And we do that with um, data-driven um, management approaches where we provide the information that's at essential to making decisions to protect the water and the ecosystem. I'm joined today by some of our wonderful board members and also our advisory council and uh, Julie Pringle, who uh, runs our field program. Um, Julie will be taking questions through chat. So when you have them, uh, because this is such a good, a large group, we'll ask you to send them to Julie in chat. The way we're gonna do the format of today's presentation is that we've collected a lot of questions from around the island. These are all the questions that we've been sent. Um, and Dr. Gobler is going to give us a basic introduction to cyanobacteria, and then we're gonna go through the questions. I'm gonna serve as the moderator, and at the end of the um, presentation, we'll take the questions that Julie's uh, received through chat. Sorry to be so structured, but we wanna make sure that we're getting a cohesive mes message across to this large group. Um, now that the, all the details are out of the way, um, I'd ask everybody to keep themselves on mute for now because it's such a large group. Um, and I want to start by saying we're very fortunate to have Dr. Christopher Goldler here today with us. Um, he's the endowed chair of coastal ecology and conservation at St Stony Brook University. And so he's our neighbor a bit south um, in Long Island. Dr. Goldler's lab studies the ecosystem health of over 30 coastal ponds in Long Island, and he's an expert in both cyanobacteria and the impacts of climate change um, in these very precious pond ecosystems. Long Island's been dealing with regular blooms for an extended period of time. They have um, sort of denser development than the island and they have different ecosystem pressures. So unfortunately for them, that's been going on, but thankfully they have a great monitoring program and ways of communicating what's going on and keeping the community apprised. Um, so, our island community is a bit behind the, the curve here because we haven't had to deal with frequent and widespread blooms. So environmentally, that's a good thing. But in terms of monitoring, we've got a lot to learn. So today we're hoping to benefit from all that Dr. Gobler has learned over his years of studying uh, these ecosystems. So without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Gobler and thank him for his time. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's see if I can get my... Um presentation up here. Um, looks like I can. Uh, let's just get this in a second. Okay, here we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you all. Um, uh, from one island to another, I guess Long Island is pretty different than Martha's Vineyard, but um, there's a fair bit of similarities as well. And so I'm happy to talk to you about uh, blue-green algae, toxicinobacteria, and harmful algal blooms in general. So I'm gonna give a brief overview and then hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, I just wanna start by just talking about cyanobacteria. Um, you know, I have no idea what anyone's background is in the call. So, uh, but cyanobacteria are really amazing. If you didn't know, cyanobacteria are the first photosynthetic organisms to evolve on this planet more than 3 billion years ago. So they started photosynthesis on planet Earth. And uh, as you know, all energy and life on the planet re relies on, or almost all relies on photosynthesis. So we really have to thank the cyanobacteria for the evolution of life on this planet as we know it. Uh, and despite the fact they evolved 3 billion years ago, it turns out uh, that cyanobacteria are the most abundant photosynthetic organisms on planet Earth today. So there are more cyanobacteria than any other type of photosynthetic organism on the planet. Um, and that's actually true for just one genera of cyanobacteria in the ocean. So there's more, for example, prochlorococcus cells in the ocean than any other photosynthetic organism on the planet. And cyanobacteria are ubiquitous. You can find them in marine systems. I just mentioned the ocean and freshwater systems. Uh, on land. Um, and so, you know, you really will find them anywhere and on all seven continents as well. Uh, so they really are, um, you know, part of and the foundation of life as we know it on planet Earth. Um, however, they also can fit into the realm of harmful algal blooms. 
I've been studying harmful algal blooms for nearly 30 years since I was a graduate student. And uh, the term harmful algal blooms is actually new. It was coined while I was a graduate student uh, to recognize and uh, the fact that harmful algal blooms are events that can occur in marine or freshwater bodies. Uh, they used to be called red tides to, um, and you can see some red discoloration here because many of the organisms that, organisms that form these events are actually known as dinoflagellates. Uh, but in the late 1990s, scientists recognized that uh, these events are occurring in both marine and freshwater bodies. And as you can see from this image, can come in all sorts of uh, colors. And so in the 90s, United States scientists and really global scientists agreed to use the term harmful algal blooms. Um, and as you can see in the lower left, that the, the discoloration there, that is actually some um, blue-green algae. And so they fit within that, or cyanobacteria, and they fit within that realm. Um, among the literally thousands of genera of cyanobacteria, there are several that are known to be harmful, um, harmful to potentially humans uh, and or aquatic ecosystems. And some of them are listed here with some representative images of these organisms. This is from a review paper uh, that I published with some other scientists uh, a few years back. And you can see some of the major genera of cyanobacteria. These are all, the first six are all really freshwater cyanobacteria. Um, but I'll also point out, uh, so that's you know, one through five are freshwater. Number six is actually like a freshwater seaweed. And the last two are actually marine. And the one uh, is uh, one you can actually see with your, with your eyes. So we worry about these cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms for several reasons. One, when they grow dense, they can uh, have ill effects in aquatic ecosystems, like can lead to low oxygen uh, or can degrade uh, aquatic uh, plants, uh, but we're most concerned about the toxins they can make. And so there are really three major classes of toxins that cyanobacteria uh, can synthesize, and they include neurotoxins, hepatotoxins, and uh, dermatoxins. Um, and you can see the names of them here. And, um, and we always know these are serious compounds because the most common of them, microcystin, when it was first discovered in the uh, mid 20th century, its first name was called, uh, was fast death factor. Um, and then when anatoxin was discovered shortly thereafter, its first name was very fast death factor. Uh, they've obviously since been renamed, but clearly um, the, the, the biological uh, and biomedical implications of these compounds were known or have been known for decades. Uh, and their global issues. This is just a map from a paper, review paper that I published with my graduate student Matt Harkey in 2016, where we took a global view of uh, literally every country on the planet. Um, and what you can see just for this single genera, microcystis, it can be found in nearly every country across the globe, which really makes these events unique because when it comes to the marine harmful algal blooms, they're very much regional, uh, but these become global issues. And, um, and we know in the United States that it's now a widespread issue. This is a map compiled by the Environmental Working Group just last summer, um, really showing that there's not a state in the union that doesn't experience uh, blue-green algae blooms. And in fact, this is actually toxic blue-green algae blooms, ones that make microcystins. So this really is a universal uh, concern. And it can be a serious concern, uh, the most common Toxin made by uh, blue-green algae in freshwater systems is microcystin, uh, and there are all sorts of concerns with regards to the potential role of this compound in uh, promoting tumors and being uh, potentially carcinogenic. Um, and it's for that reason that just recently the EPA finalized guidelines uh, for both, uh, you can see microcystin and the other uh, blue-green algal toxin, cylinder spermopsin, uh, and they have specific guidelines for drinking water, depending on the age of people, whether it's um, infants, school age, preschool children, or then school age children. You can see the, comp the regulatory levels change depending on those ages. Uh, and they've also established recreational limits for uh, microcystin as well, because they're, I mentioned uh, there's the potential for um, 
dermatitis and other sorts of effects for these cyanobacterial compounds. That's not necessarily from microcystin itself, but it's one of the best and easiest to measure cyanobacterial compounds. So it's really used uh, in some cases as an indicator, uh, and that's being the case here. Um, and I'll just mention as an aside that in addition to these federal guidelines, uh, different states may set their own guidelines as well. And so, for example, in New York, they have guidelines that are actually based on the amount of cyanobacterial or blue-green algal biomass. Um, and then their toxin levels for recreation are, um, uh, they don't use toxins, they use the levels of biomass. Uh, again, with the idea being that there are other toxins to be worried about besides uh, microcystin. Uh, besides the effects on humans, we worry about the potential effects on our pets. Uh, this study by the CDC demonstrated that there have been hundreds of cases of uh, dog poisonings uh, through the decades. And um, just last summer, in a one-week period, there were 10 dogs that died across the United States in four different states. Um, then I can say on Long Island, we have had um, uh, dog deaths as well as dog illnesses um, uh, over the years. And uh, maybe you saw in the news just uh, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, there was a mysterious incident this summer of elephants dying across Botswana, and, um, and no one knew what was going on. It started over the summer, and then the declaration was made just a few weeks ago that this was being caused by toxic blue green algae blooms, um, which is kind of remarkable if you think about the size of an elephant, uh, that these toxins would be that potent. Um, although it reminds me of a case maybe a decade ago where there were uh, elk, a herd of uh, over 100 elk in the uh, southwest U.S. that also died from consuming water uh, that had high levels of blue-green algal toxins. In the U.S. Uh, and Canada, the, the largest uh, sources, so potential sources of blue-green algal blooms would be in the Great Lakes. So you may know the Great Lakes represent 20 percent of Earth's fresh water supply. And as you look at the Great Lakes here, you can see by eye uh, that the southern extent of these lakes uh, are a little green. And, uh, and that's consistent with there being more population there. And also the fact that these blue-green algae blooms are also promoted by higher temperatures and are most likely to occur in systems with higher temperatures and higher levels of nutrients. So if you look amongst the Great Lakes, you can see clearly Lake Erie stands out as the water body with the most intensive blue-green algae blooms. Uh, you can see that here. This is an aerial image from Lake Erie. Uh, my lab group actually made a trip to Lake Erie uh, in September uh, to study the blue-green algae blooms there. We had to sort of fit it in between uh, quarantine regulations made by New York State for traveling there. Um, but we've been there many times uh, through the years and, uh, you know, they have a big problem with blue-green algae blooms there because of significant inputs of nutrients, specifically from agriculture. Um, and you can see from the lower inset that, the, uh, that they're most intense, the events are most intense in the um, southwest corner here. That's because of what's known as the Maumee River, biggest source of nutrients to the lake. So these events are, again, promoted by high levels of nutrients uh, and likely crop up during the summer because they also are promoted by higher temperatures. And um, I'm completing a paper now with some colleagues uh, from um, Bowling Green State University in Ohio showing that the decadal warming of Lake Erie has led to an earlier onset of these events and a longer bloom season. And we've seen similar trends for temperature sensitive harmful algal blooms uh, in the Northeast US as well. Um, and sometimes those events in Lake Erie can have serious consequences uh, in 2014, for example, the entire city of Toledo, uh, more than a half a million people were without water for an extended period. Um, what you're looking at here is the Toledo water supply intake. You can see what the surface water looks like. Now they knew about the blue-green algae blooms and they had treatment for that. And they actually, in, thankfully, take their water in from, uh, from depth rather than from surface. But uh, the bloom that year was earlier and they didn't have their treatment in place in time. Uh, so that can be a serious consequence of these events. Uh, turning more locally, I just wanted to give you a very quick flavor of some of the work that uh, is done on Long Island. Um, 
and then just show, uh, so, so I'll start with this map. Uh, this is a map my lab generated uh, just this month, actually. Uh, and it documents all of the harmful algal blooms, low oxygen events, um, uh, and low oxygen events across Long Island just this summer from June through October. And, um, and you can see from the green, there are no shortage of events of blue-green algae blooms uh, that have occurred across Long Island, more than two dozen locations. Now, importantly, we only declare uh, a site having a blue-green algae bloom if it exceeds the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, regulatory limits. Uh, and so they have a limit based on the amount of biomass. And so that's anytime you see a listing here. In fact, my lab is in charge of monitoring uh, all of downstate New York, so that's Long Island and New York City for blue-green algae. So we monitor um, dozens of sites every week. We get samples from New York City, including Central Park. Um, and we report out on a weekly basis uh, to the DEC, and then they report out uh, to uh, county health officials. But you can see the, the, the point being here that these events are widespread uh, and quite common, uh, particularly you can see here on the South Fork of Long Island. And what's interesting is that the South Fork has many water bodies that are quite similar to what you find on Martha's Vineyard, uh, including one that I've worked on known as Georgia Capont. Uh, and I know we have on the call uh, Sarah Davison, who's the executive director of the Friends of Georgia Capon. Uh, so I've been working with the Friends and, um, and on Georgia Capon for about a decade now. Uh, and again, if you look at this water body, it should look familiar to you uh, because morphologically and geomorphologically and geologically, it holds a lot of parallels to the water bodies on Martha's Vineyard. And in fact, uh, in, again, in parallel to some of the water bodies on Martha's Vineyard, it, it doesn't show here, but in the southern extent, uh, the beach here is actually purposely breached so that a, a new inlet is dug within uh, into the, the pond uh, at least twice a year. In fact, it was done just on Monday uh, of this week uh, to drain out the pond and allow for ocean flushing. Um, but you know, I started my work in Georgica Pond because it was afflicted by very intense blue-green algae blooms. Uh, and it was the location of a dog death that occurred in 20. 12 that initiated my monitoring in 2013. Um, you can see this is one of the more intense events that occurred there uh, that triggered a closure of the pond uh, by the DEC and by the East Hampton Town Trustees. Uh, coincidence with some of these events was the death of uh, aquatic life, fish, eels. Um, uh, so things were not in good shape. Um, but I will say uh, that there's been good news in Georgia Capon in more recent years. Um, this is monitoring data going back. We actually started in 2013, but don't have the same types of measures from 2013. But uh, these are our fluorometric measurements made uh, showing the very intense blooms that occurred in 2014 and 2015. Uh, 2015 marked when the French Georgia Capon was founded and when they began their remedial efforts to the pond, specifically looking to harvest seaweeds, upgrade septic systems, uh, work on dredging and other um, educational measures. And you can see it since that time, uh, the blooms have been less intense. So just very briefly, I had been shown some of the data that's been collected uh, on Martha's Vineyard. And so I just wanted to just show, or just talk about one data set that was collected and that's specifically the levels of microcystin, because um, that's something I'm quite familiar with. Um, and you can see the concentrations that are shown here. Um, I just wanted to put these concentrations, however, in perspective. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that the US EPA has guidelines for both drinking water and for recreational water. And when they split up the drinking water, they have levels that are for both uh, infants, bottle fed infants and preschool children, and then other levels for older children and adults. Uh, I will see those limits are based on assuming someone consumes the surface waters as their drinking water supply uh, every day uh, for that part of their lifetime. Um, so just showing what in this figure here, this is the recreational limit for microcystin, uh, according to the US EPA. Uh, this is the child and adult drinking water limit. Uh, and then this is the infant limit. 
And again, I converted here to match the units on the last figure, nanograms per liter. Uh, these units, EPA actually uses micrograms per liter. Uh, so it's really eight, uh, I believe it's 1.7 and 0.3. Uh, but you can see even the highest level that was found in the uh, Martha's Vineyard water bodies, uh, quite low uh, relative to these standards. And again, the drinking water standards are based on uh, chronic consumption. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to present are just some monitoring approaches that we've used. Uh, Emily had asked me to just talk a little bit about monitoring, so I just wanted to throw this slide up here. When we monitor for blue-green algae, uh, we usually take what I call a tiered approach, and it's tiered based on, um, you know, what we know about the water body and what the goals and objectives are. Um, so I think similar to the study that had been done on Martha's Vineyard, we do uh, use uh, fluorometric screening. Uh, we use a device that's, uh, I think, now pretty much a standard across um, an international standard in that it allows for the analysis of both blue-green algae, uh, but also other types of algae, uh, what we can call maybe the, the good algae. And that's of value because it gives you a sense of the relative ratio, how much, what, because what we found is sometimes it's what's as important as the amount of blue-green algae is how much is there relative to the total community. Uh, because once you get a situation where you have nothing but the blue-green algae, you can then have a, um, a problematic situation where the blue-green algae, in some ways you could say, hijack the ecosystem uh, and can lead to these long and extended blooms. Upon fluorometric analysis, if we do see high levels, because this is an analysis that's done um, instantaneously, uh, that would then trigger further analyses to identify, we see high levels, what are the types of blue-green algae there microscopically, uh, and also what are the toxins that we might find. Uh, we most commonly screen for microcystin, but we do have a liquid chromatograph mass spectrometer that measures anatoxin A and um, about 10 saxitoxin congeners. Uh, we, are always, we always make environmental measurements as well to understand uh, the ecosystem conditions there. Uh, and that can be tiered as well. It can get quite complex. So for example, in Georgia Capond, uh, since I think 2015, we've had what I call a continuous monitoring buoy that's always measuring uh, the levels of nutrients and algae and blue-green algae and dissolved oxygen and light. Uh, and that data is telemetered to a website so anybody can be uh, viewing that data on a consistent measurement over time. Uh, and that can be very valuable because then you don't need to go and look if a bloom is uh, occurring and breaking out. You can actually see it with your own eyes. It also triggers things like, uh, gives you information about something like a, a hypoxic event. Uh, for example, we saw one develop in Georgia Cabal in the summer. Sarah and I were quite concerned and we uh, went to the DEC to take emergency action to improve the conditions there. So there is value in that sort of uh, continuous measurement, but we can also make these measurements um, just by hand on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, and then there's further work we do, experimental work, to try to understand what are the environmental drivers. That is, you know, why if you do have these events, what are the triggers? What's making these events uh, uh, pop up and become more and less intense? Um, and then we also do use uh, what we call omic tools, uh, genomics and transcriptomics, where you can use genomics to understand uh, the diversity of the algal community or the cyanobacterial community. And that can be valuable because there are types of cyanobacteria that, are, that don't really show up well microscopically, uh, hidden species um, that show up, and, and even uh, microbes that actually can be embedded within the cyanobacteria but might have important ecosystem effects. Um, and then we use something known as transcriptomics, which looks at gene expression. Uh, which can be very useful for understanding uh, environmental drivers uh, and how the community is responding to a given set of environmental conditions. So with that, I am done, and I thank you kindly for your attention, and I think we can move now to the uh, questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for that detailed context and understanding sort of how cyanobacteria function globally, their actually really important role, and then which few species can have a negative impact when they bloom. Um, one of the things that's uh, really important for us to understand is what 
we can do um, to help reduce the chance of having blooms. And you, you mentioned this, the work in Georgia Pond. Um, could you go into that a little bit more about um, what can be done to sort of try to counteract the effects? That, um, we know that warm temperatures and nutrients can drive blooms. What can we do as a community to reduce the, the conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always like to say, given that it's, it is temperature and nutrients, um, you know, we're not stopping uh, global warming. And, um, you know, I've done work in the Northeast where we've used satellite data to look at the literally day by day temperature trends since 1982 in our region. Um, and re actually, you know, in, in regions even beyond here. Um, and actually, unfortunately, we live in a zone that's warming faster than the rest of the, 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 uh, the globe. And in fact, particularly in summer, and that's what's most important for the blue green algae. Uh, the warming rate in our region in summer is about three times the global average. Now, that's not the case for all seasons. So, for example, uh, there's no trend in the spring, uh, warming in the fall, this, um, um, uh, and in the summer, um, and winter, not a very strong trend. But in summer, when these events are important, it's warming at three times the global average. And what that means is that since we're not controlling that and we're now more vulnerable to these events than we had been decades ago, we need to double down on controlling nutrients. Um, and I will say on the nutrient front, there's two important, before any measures can be taken or should be taken to combat nutrients, there's really two, a few, at least two important pieces of information that you need. And that is, what are the most important sources of nutrients to your water body? And two, what are the nutrients that are driving the blue-green algae? And, um, you know, having done enough of these uh, nutrient loading models, uh, honestly, I won't say it's like spinning, spinning the wheel of fortune wheel, but there, it's always a surprise to find out in a given water body what the most important sources of nutrients are. Um, and I can tell you, for example, for Georgia Pond, it was on-site septics and wastewater. Now, about, I don't know, Sarah, maybe it's 100 or 200 feet to the west, you have Wainscott Pond, also experiences incredibly dense blue-green algae blooms. In fact, now much more so than Georgica. Well, the main source of nutrients there is actually agriculture. And these water bodies are right next to each other. But the, the bottom line is each water body has its own watershed. So, you know, a takeaway there is that you really want to make sure you know what the most important nutrient sources are if you want to be effective in having uh, and reducing levels to a given water body. Um, and again, you also kind of need to know what are the, the nutrient source, the types of nutrients that are driving the cyanobacteria. It's long been assumed that, oh, blue-green algae are promoted by phosphorus, so we'll just control the phosphorus. Well, um, that was a great model for some, um, uh, for some lakes up in the northern plains of Canada. However, uh, there is a, the, the new emerging paradigm is that nitrogen is also important, um, particularly in the fact that the types, there are some cyanobacteria bacteria that make their own nitrogen. And if that's what you have, well then you don't need to worry about nitrogen. But the types that we see on Long Island and I think are abundant and have been found in some of the, the ponds there, it's things like microcystis, are wholly reliant on what we call the exogenous nutrient supply. So what's already in the pond, there, so that they're reliant on the nitrogen. And the compound microcystin is a nitrogen-rich compound. And the research shows that the more nitrogen that cyanobacteria have, the more microcystin they can make. Um, and so despite the fact that the dogma is that it's phosphorus is the most important element for controlling blue-green algae, uh, there are many reasons to think about and worry about nitrogen as well. And what remediation efforts have um, helped kind of, kind of turn the tide in Georgica Pond? You showed us a real reduction in the fluorescence, um, but what, what remediation activities? You told us about the sources. Yeah, I mean, the, the one that probably had the most immediate effects, we believe, is actually the harvesting of macrophytes, so seaweeds and aquatic plants um, that were really overgrowing uh, Georgica Pond. And we had observed um, an ecological succession whereby during the 
spring and early summer, there'd be the overgrowth of seaweeds and macrophytes. Um, and then when the, temper the peak summer temperatures happened, those plants died, they released their nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's when we saw the blue-green algae. So we undertook an effort to remove those macrophytes, and, um, and you know, with that, we really haven't seen the blue-green algae. Um, and it was a significant event. In some years, we removed more than 90,000 pounds worth of aquatic plants. Um, and that represented a significant amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. But that was like the emergency measure. Now, in parallel, uh, the Forensic Georgica Pond has made great efforts at upgrading septic systems. Um, again, we identified that on-site septic systems was the largest source of nitrogen uh, to the pond. So there's been a great effort um, that's been facilitated by efforts in the county uh, to allow the installation of advanced septic systems that do a better job, or not a better job, a, a good job, and remove a lot of nitrogen relative to a standard um, cesspool or septic tank with a cesspool, which really don't remove, they don't remove any nitrogen. Um, and then there's been efforts in educating people about uh, fertilizer use uh, and other kinds of best management practices and, um, you know, controlling the, the dredging has also been important. We, we realize how important that cut, leaving that ocean cut open, that that can be beneficial as well. So it's really been a series of things, both immediate and sort of long-term. That makes sense. So we're getting lots of different types of questions, um, but one just, this is complicated. So um, could we have the short version of this? Cause I know this could probably take a whole presentation. How do you determine different types of nitrogen sources? What techniques to differentiate from your wastewater versus your septic versus your agriculture? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's multiple methods. The most common one used uh, on Long Island has been something known as the nitrogen loading model. And it's really just that it's a, it's a watershed based model where you determine the number of people in the watershed. You use GIS to do a parcel by parcel analysis of the entire watershed uh, to know the number of people, agricultural practices, um, use satellite imagery to by to the you know square meter, figure out how many uh, how many lawns are in the, the, um, in the watershed. Um, so that's one way I can go into further detail, but I'll, I'll save it. Uh, we also have something else we use that's known as a volumetric flux model, um, where you can get a sense of the water flow and the concentrations of nutrients in that water. And that can give you an answer. Um, in both of these, we typically supplement those models with looking at sediments. Uh, because those are very important uh, nitrogen and phosphorus sources that are that are actually ignored by the two models that I just used. Uh, and then we've also used um, we've used nitrogen isotopes, uh, and by looking at those, you can get a sense of the extent to which the um, the relative importance of fertilizers versus wastewater as a nitrogen source. Great, thank you for that. I know that wasn't a, a simple thing to answer quickly. Um, one big question everybody is asking is when is it safe to go in the water? People are worried about their health. They're worried about um, getting skin contact. They're worried about aerosols. They're worried about their pets. What are sort of the basic parameters when you stay out of the water and when you can go back into it um, after a bloom? Yeah, well, I can, you know, I can speak to the New York situation whereby, um, and it's slightly different between the um, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation versus the New York State Health Department, Health Department being more in charge of uh, bathing, public bathing beaches. Uh, for the DEC, uh, there's a, I mentioned a, a th biomass threshold above which they will close a water body, and then when it's below that, they'll reopen it. Um, similarly, I think the Can Department you of Health biomass threshold for people. Sure. So that's again using the the fluoroprobe, uh, which is a, a fluorometric measuring device that measures the amount of uh, blue green algae versus other types of algae in the water. Um, we actually go through a in the new, in the state we have uh, semi annual powwows with all we all get together with our uh, BBE fluoroprobes and calibrate them against standards to make sure that everybody across the state's making the same measurement at the same time. Um, so there's no confusion about that. We've actually sent them back to the manufacturers in Germany to have them do the calibrations on occasion as well. 
uh, again, in unison, so we all are getting the same answer. Um, but in, a, you know, in absence of that sort of monitoring, you know, I, uh, you'll see the EPA and other groups essentially say, and even the DEC, you know, if the water's green, probably good to not go in. Uh, and certainly good to keep your pets away. You know, I, I didn't have a chance to mention, but I will mention now. One of the real dangers of these events, besides just the whole water being green and having the cyanobacteria, is that one of the uh, ecological strategies of these blue-green algae is they tend to float at the surface. And if you get a consistent wind blowing in a consistent direction, what that can do is concentrate and magnify the amount of blue-green algae in a given location and in some cases, you can get a, what we call a shoreline scum. And you can get a, you know, instead of it being liquid, these blue-green algae become a solid. And you've, you know, in, in effect, what you've done is you've taken the level in the water body and concentrated it by orders of magnitude. And that becomes the danger to pets. Um, you know, because if a dog gets into that and starts licking that up, again, it's not the level of toxin that's in the lake, but it's actually that level times maybe a thousand. Uh, and we think that's probably the means by which uh, pets are endangered. So, you know, in absence of data, you can use the eye test. If the water is green, if you see these dense green accumulations uh, along the shoreline, you know, that's a signal you definitely want to keep yourself, your children, your pets um, out of the water and away from the water. So say we did have data and we had a monitoring program in place, um, say that all worked out. Um, when would you say get out of the water and when would you, after a bloom is no longer visible, say get back in the water? That's sort of, we're trying to figure out where those bounds are. Yeah, I mean, I, the only, my only answer there would be, you know, you should align, you could, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the, um, what the state regulations are there and the state guidance is. Um, so I would, you know, I don't want to speak out of, uh, out of line and out of terms. I would, I would turn to that firstly, um, but like I said, in New York State, we have a clear clear guidance on these cross calibrated fluoroprobes, uh, and it's 25 micrograms per liter of pigment um, with those calibrated fluoroprobes. So you know we could always uh, run a sample and see how it measures up. And I will I will just say on that front, um, we some of the samples we do get like from Central Park in Manhattan, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, uh, are sent to us uh, overnight mail um, for, for analysis. Thank you very much. Um, another question people had is about consumption. Um, it, when, so I guess it probably depends on the state limits again. When is it safe to consume things? And is it, what, should we, we be worried about consumption with any other type of blue-green algae other than the surface scum forming? Or, are, because uh, there were a few things reported when the data came out and people were concerned um, when there were small cyanobacteria and high levels of BMAA, could you get in the water? Could you swim? Could you eat shellfish? Could you eat finfish? Um, when is it not safe to eat things that are growing in the ponds? Um, you know, there's no regulation. There's regulation of microcystin. And that's a well-known and well-studied uh, compound. And, and again, the, the local guidance here has been when, you know, when it seeds the levels that closes the water body to both um, recreation, but also to shellfish and specifically uh, blue crabs, for example. Um, I will say there is evidence for transfer of microcystin uh, to, for example, Eastern oysters. Um, I don't know, you know, how high the salinity gets in some of your water bodies and the extent to which you may or may not have oyster populations. Um, but that's something to look at. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so what, another question that came up is, say one part of the water, one part of the body of water has um, the green surface scum, is it safe to swim somewhere else? Or would you just avoid the entire pond? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it kind of would depend on how big the wa water body is uh, and what the recent history of it is. Um, uh, in, in general, like I said, some of the guidance is if it's clear, you're in the clear, so to speak. Or if there's, there's some tagline that has to do with green staying away, but I can't remember the rhyme right now. But 
But if um, we had data and concentrations of biomass, we could really answer that question better, right? Um, yes, I would say, yeah. Okay, so if we had some more data, maybe that would be helpful. Um, so you already answered a, a bunch of the questions that we have here. Um, talking about, you talked about the surface forming scums. Do we, are there different levels of ri risk in different depths of the water? Um, where you, are you ever gonna see is cyanobacteria that you're worried about always gonna be at the surface or is it gonna get in mats, get into the vegetation? Um, people are asking sort of localized risk. Um, yeah. yeah, well, you do see, I mean, in, in general, many of the cyanobacteria, particularly microcystis, is concentrated at the surface and therefore levels are lower at depth, but there are other cyanobacteria that it's the reverse. So it, it does a little bit depend on uh, the types of cyanobacteria that are present. Okay, thank you. Um, do storms, rain, and wind reduce exposure risk by diluting the toxins? When uh, blooms are blown apart, are they less toxic or spread more widely? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on the situation. Uh, you know, certainly if you, like I said, you, a, a potential very dangerous situation is when you have that concentrated scum. Um, but, you know, if that water to be washed back into the water, uh, when that, the bloom in the water had actually gone away, that could be reintroducing and re-inoculating the water body. So, um, yeah, hard to say on that point. We need some data. That makes sense. Um, so there are different, you talked about microcystins, you talked about anatoxin A, um, we heard before about PMAA. Could you talk about the risks associated with each type of uh, toxin or cyanotoxin and what is what's on is there anything else we should be concerned about which sort of qualifying what's the most concerning and what we really need to monitor for yeah i mean it you know that's a great question in general in the united states microcystin is the most common toxin and it's most but also the, the easiest to measure and the most commonly measured um, you know, some of these other compounds, though, the neurotoxins, antitoxin A and saxitoxin, um, are serious compounds. And, you know, if, if, if the organisms that made those compounds were present, um, you know, that could be a very serious risk that you'd want to have a handle on. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I won't say a lot about BMAA. Um, it's, it's a pretty controversial topic. There's not great agreement on many, many aspects of it. Um, you know, it's not regulated presently. And, um, you know, I think for some good reasons, uh, jury is still out on many aspects of that compound. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't, uh, yeah. So I don't, I don't want to throw myself in the middle of all that, but I, I, I will just say that I, I'm the editor of the journal Harmful Algae, which is the international Forum, uh, it's a peer, international peer-reviewed publication, uh, excuse me, international peer-reviewed journal that publishes uh, the, the, the bulk of the articles on toxic algae. And, um, you know, I just will say that there's not, and so I have a pretty good handle on the state of the literature. And, um, you know, there's not, I'll say two things. There's not a lot of research on BMAA and there for, for the, each article that comes to a single conclusion, um, I can definitely find the article that counters that and finds the opposite result. Um, so it's, it's, in my mind, just objective view of the literature that's out there. And again, I feel I'm fairly abreast of it that it's, um, there's, there's, uh, there's certainly differences of opinion with regards to uh, whether, there's, whether there should be concern or how much concern there should be about that conflict. Thank you. Um, we weren't just going to give you the easy questions today. Sorry about that. Um, so lots of interest and lots of um, questions here. Another one that's coming up is can harmful algal blooms be predicted? Um, so you talked about when you had ratios where a one, one type of organism was dominating or just a couple that was more likely for blooms to occur. But could you talk about other factors you see in the environment that are sort of ripe for a bloom to occur? predictive factors? Yeah, sure. I mean, certainly temperature is a huge one. You know, I can, I can predict for water bodies I've been saying for a long time that are prone to blue green algae blooms. I can predict the start of these events with, uh, you know, within a, a couple of weeks usually. 
Um, and then again, it's a temperature trigger and it gets warm enough. Uh, the algal community goes through a succession and finally it's the term for the blue green algae. So um, what, what temperature, where are you seeing that? What's that, where you know it's coming? Yeah, I mean, the, the water body that I have in mind that we've studied the most, it's usually like around 20 degrees centigrade. So, you know, somewhere around 70 degrees or so. Um, but again, it's partly dependent on the, the water body because there's other co-factors that, that are important and the types of uh, blue ground algae you have present. But, but so certainly, yeah, where, how can you predict it? Well, you can predict it based on temperature. Um, you know, and then certainly what I've found in general is that if a water body has had a blue green algae bloom once, um, it tends to recur. Um, so that's, you know, that is also something that can, you know, be a trigger. And then the other thing is you can measure nutrient levels. And in general, you know, that you, if you, there's a um, higher probability of having blue green algae blooms when the levels of phosphorus are higher. Um, again, I did emphasize nitrogen is also important, but, you know, historically, if you know the levels of phosphorus uh, in a water body, um, you know, if you gave me, the, if we knew the total phosphorus concentrations in a dozen uh, water bodies, uh, we could predict which ones would be most vulnerable to the blue-green algae, and incidentally, it'd be the ones with the highest levels. I, I'll also just mention salinity. I know some of your water bodies have a range of salinity, so certainly there's, these are generally freshwater phenomenon, but they, you know, depending on the type of blue-green algae, you can have, um, you know, salinities below 15, you start to become vulnerable to these sorts of events. But again, it kind of it depends a little bit on the, what the indigenous blue-green algae population is like. Okay. Um, so there's more fun questions coming. Let's see. Um, what challenges, um, so we, like you mentioned, we have some ecosystems where the salinity fluctuates depending on how um, much uh, fresh water is coming in, how recently since a cut has occurred, or a few different things. Can you talk about the challenges of monitoring brackish ecosystems when you're um, having kind of fluctuating salinity? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing where you want to, like Georgia Pond is a great example. You know, it opens to the ocean and then it closes in the, usually in the spring. And so, you know, when that salinity stays above 15, you know, we monitor, but I know that there's not going to be any blue green algae. Um, but it's when we get into that window of, okay, the salinity is below 15. Okay, now the temperatures are above, you know, 70 degrees. Uh, you know, now we're in the, the potential danger zone. We need to be on higher alert. Um, you know, I will just say as a uh, aside, I think I might have mentioned it before, but, um, you know, in, in, in the systems where you have the ability to control the flushing, like that's the way it is on, there's three water bodies on uh, South Fork of Long Island where they're opened uh, on occasion. And, uh, you know, it's crystal clear. You have the cut open, that ocean water comes in, and you're not going to have these dense blooms of blue-green algae. Um, you know, we have some reasons uh, due to endangered birds that we have to keep those cuts. Uh, we can't open those cuts during certain times of the year due to piping plover type of endangered bird. But, um, but I, you know, we've seen it, we saw it in Georgica Pond. Just yesterday, there was another pond that's two over from Georgica called Sagaponic Pond. I was just looking at that data. And um, they had a blue-green algae bloom in uh, July, August. They opened the cut, the bloom went away. But unfortunately, a storm came and closed the cut and then the bloom came right back. So, um, you know, that's just a phenomenon that is just proven over and over again. Okay, so thank you. Um, people are talk. so a lot of people have concerns about neurotoxins. So you talked about your different tiers of monitoring where you're looking at your fluorometer to see the fluorescence. You're looking at once you know that there's a problem, you identify them by microscopy and you start to screen for neurotoxins. Have you seen any raised levels of neurodegenerative diseases or clusters of ALS or things like that um, around ponds that are struggling? Because this is a major health concern for people. Um, and I want to yeah. No, we have not. Okay. No, no, no evidence of that whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, could you talk about, um, this is sort of switching topics a little, dredging activity. Um, people are curious, I think, because some of our ponds in Georgica Pond are related. And so 
um, are any of the ponds um, that you're studying dredged um, and how frequently and to what effect? Yeah, so Georgica Pond, the, uh, the cut to the ocean is dredged. Um, and that has the positive effect of flushing out the pond. Um, we have, I, I will say, as I mentioned, when we look at nutrient sources, uh, an additional approach that we take that's not in the typical models is we look at the sediments. Um, and I will say there's been other freshwater bodies, including Georgia, actually, where we've, we've I've recommended that dredging would be, uh, dredging is recommended. Um, you know, I don't, again, I don't know a lot about the water bodies there, but I can say um, for many of the coastal ponds on Long Island, they were formed at the same time uh, the ones in Martha's Vineyard were formed, you know, when that glacier retreated about 10,000 years ago. And so the fact of the matter is, when that glacier was there, these ponds were just, you know, those salt ponds were all sand at the bottom, nothing but sand, beautiful, clean sugar sand. But over time, you know, the process of eutrophication um, fills in these ponds and, you know, that can lead to these muddy sediments. And those muddy sediments become a reservoir for, uh, well, organic carbon, but more importantly, nitrogen and phosphorus that can drive these events. Um, and so if, you're, if there's the opportunity to dredge a water body down to the original sand layer, you know, you're removing you know, up maybe hundreds of years of eutrophication and potentially resetting that water body. Can you explain um, eutrophication just for a minute? Sure. You know, it has two different definite, well, uh, the official definition of eutrophication is the accumulation of organic matter within a water body. And that was devised in, this, in the 60s for just fresh water bodies. Since that time, it's uh, taken on a more broad definition whereby the accelerated, accelerated delivery of nitrogen and phosphorus that can promote algal blooms, both microalgal blooms like we're talking about or seaweed blooms, then leads to the accumulation of organic matter in that system um, uh, that can have other ill effects like low oxygen as well. So again, by dredging, you, you have the opportunity to remove all that, you know, the, the, the mud that's in there that is enriched in organic matter um, that probably is a rich source of nitrogen and phosphorus and is also a, uh, removes oxygen from the water body. Um, but again, it's, it's, I will say that's very ecosystem specific. Um, again, I know nothing about the sediments in uh, Martha's Vineyard, and that might not apply there at all, but I do know that uh, there are several water bodies on Long Island where uh, those sediments are really important as a, as a strong source of nutrients. How about in terms of flushing? When you dredged, have you noticed any difference in um, sort of how far the saline water makes it into the pond or how much it increases in salinity? Because that's one of the things we're tracking on Egertown Great Pond, and we've seen a huge difference um, after a season of dredging and then after with a season where there was no dredging. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, we don't, I don't have enough data to really speak to that ex, uh, experientially, uh, but, you know, as you described it, that makes good sense, you know, although I, you know, I'd say it's going to be a function of the, you know, the depth of the ecosystem as well as, um, you know, the hydrodynamics in any given water body. Right, to make, that makes total sense. Um, so let's see. There's so much interest, so I'm trying to keep up with everybody's questions. Thank you for also keeping up with them. Um, we wanted to know um, how often you monitor, when you begin to monitor, when you stop monitoring, and if your frequency changes in monitoring, if you see certain conditions, and if so, what's the, what's the change in frequency and what's, what are the conditions? Um, good question. And so, you know, a lot of the, the answer there, it's a function of two things. It's one, a function of uh, our history with the water body and what we expect, and also just the level of uh, uh, screening and, and availability of, uh, you know, support for a given project. Um, you know, so if we know a water body is prone to blue-green algae, and it's a program where we have support to investigate the blue-green algae, uh, we do weekly monitoring, and we started, um, in the spring and we continue it into the fall usually. Um, and you know, in some, some cases, uh, Lake Agawam in Southampton, for example, we one year sampled until it froze over because literally the week before it froze over, it, was, it had blue-green algae levels above the state threshold. 
Um, and so again, so the answer is it kind of depends on, on the water body and the evolving conditions. So if you have a super fresh, super nutrient dense, or nutrient rich or eutrophic lake, you're going to monitor a broader season more frequently. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think it all, you know, it's a function of resources available, and then the extent to which you expect there to be a problem. That makes sense. Um, so we we're getting more um, questions about toxins because that's what people worry about. Um, do you are there to which ones do you monitor BMAA in your lab? We do not. Okay. Um, when you monitor toxins, what are the ones, uh, what is the sort of gold standard for um, your assay to determine the concentration of the toxins? Right. So we use two approaches, um, you know, for microcystin. Um, you know, my laboratory is certified by the New York State Department of Health. They have a program called the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. So our lab is accredited by the state to measure microcystin. Uh, they only accredit one method for that, and that's an ELISA method. Um, and so we follow that to the book. We get tested by the state health department several times a year. Um, and that's what we adhere to because uh, we're doing work for the state. Like I said, they send us samples from all across downstate New York um, and upstate on occasion as well. Uh, so that's, and I, you know, it's, it's the only EPA certified method, um, I believe, for cyanotoxins. Um, we also, however, have, uh, like I said, a liquid chromatograph mass spectrometer where we can verify the microcystins. Um, you know, I didn't get into the weeds and the toxins here, but turns out there are, um, you know, dozens of what we call, I think actually up to a hundred now, congeners of microcystin. So different, it's, it's the same basic chemical compound with a slight modification. And each congener is differentially toxic. So sometimes in some cases, we'll want to look at the different congeners uh, and that's done by LCMS. Uh, and then again, saxitoxin, there's an internationally approved uh, method for measuring different congeners of saxitoxin. Uh, that's LCMS and uh, we're using a, a broadly internationally accepted method for anatoxin via LCMS. I will say the ELISA um, is what well, that's certified for uh, microcystin. Uh, I and other international colleagues have had very uh, uh, a series of bad experiences with ELISAs for uh, compounds outside of microcystin. Uh, many cases of false positives when it comes to things like anatoxin. Um, and again, most scientists in the harmful algal bloom community, freshwater cyanobacterial harmful algal bloom community, uh, don't use nor trust the ELISAs for compounds beyond uh, microcystin. Um, and even in some cases for microcystin, you know, it's, well, we'll know when we get a, um, a bad batch of kits, um, as we'll call up colleagues and say, hey, what batch did you just get? Are you getting bad numbers or bad standards? And um, so the, you know, the, the ELISAs are, are, are nice and simple, so that's a plus, um, but they are not always reliable and especially not reliable when you get outside, in my experience and experience of my colleagues, when you get outside of microcystin. Okay. Um, so, some more tangible question. Um, how did you harvest the seaweed in Georgia the Pond? Great question. So, um, we actually had a boat, a, uh, a seaweed harvester. So, it had on the front of it uh, sort of a scoop that would then, uh, not a scoop, a conveyor belt actually. So, it went down into the water. It had a conveyor belt that would bring the seaweeds up on the conveyor belt. Um, it actually had some cutters in front of it, so it didn't go all the way down, but cut just the below the surface level, and then would bring the stuff up via conveyor belt into a, um, uh, an area where it was stored in the back of the boat. And so we've used that several times. Okay, um, thank you. And did you have, again, a weight that you said you harvested in, in a year? In one year, we had more than 90,000 pounds. Um, and in other years, I think we had 50,000 one year, uh, 60,000 maybe. I think this, we only did it for a few weeks this year, and I think it was maybe 20,000. Oh, wow. 
Where do you put your dredge spoil? The dredge spoils or the, the algae that are harvested? Well, actually both. I was asking dredge spoil, but where do you put your algae and where do you put your dredge spoils? Yeah, so we have an agreement with the town of East Hampton for the algae where we can bring it to the transfer station there as like compost material. Um, the dredging that's done to date is really the sand at the inlet. And uh, so that sand is really, I think, you know, Sarah Davis is on the line. I might partly get this wrong. I don't know if she can unmute, but I know that some of it's put back on the ocean, uh, but I think some of it is, is it, because it's very nice ocean sand, and I'll let Sarah now tell us what we do with the rest of it. Yes, uh, hi everybody. Um, all of the sand that is dredged out of Georgia Capond at the moment is, uh, is high quality sand and it's spread on beaches and dunes in the area. We're, we're not dredging any muds at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so let's see. Um, we've got a couple questions more. Had, has any, um, are you dealing with Phragmites in your area? Um, what are you doing with it? Are you doing herbicides? Are you harvesting it? How do you, do, is that something that's on your radar? Yeah, again, um, this is something that Friends of Georgia Capon has been heavily involved in. I believe it's mainly mechanical harvesting. Um, Phragmites can, you know, overgrow water bodies. Um, you know, on the one hand, it is a vegetative buffer, so it's better than no buffer. But on the other hand, it can grow into and overgrow a water body, um, making the effective volume of the water body smaller um, and fill in that water body. So I think it's mainly been mechanical harvesting and when it's removed, being replaced by native uh, near shore um, vegetation. Um, so do you, we haven't talked at all about aerosols. Is that something that's on your radar? Um, yeah, there, I mean, there certainly is the possibility of, um, there is research that has demonstrated that microcyst in can be aerosolized. Um, and certainly that's concerning. Um, you know, what hasn't been available along with that has been what the potential health effects are. Um, it doesn't seem to be aerosolized as much as some other toxins. I think about, for example, brevitoxin that's associated with blooms of Corona brevis in the Gulf of Mexico that are notorious for closing uh, beaches down there in places like Sarasota and uh, St. Petersburg. So it's not aerosolized to that extent, but it does, it is aerosolized. It does get into the air. Uh, they have found it in for example, nasal swabs in people who live near shore during an intense bloom. Um, you know, what are the health implications of that? It's not clear. If you think about the, um, you know, when they come up with these standards for microcystin, it's based on, like I said, this is your sole water source. So you'd be consuming as an adult, maybe three or four liters of water per day. Um, and so, you know, in that case, you, the levels of microcystin should not be above 1.7 uh, micrograms per liter for an adult. Um, you know, if you inhale it, you're getting exposed to a much smaller amount. So, you know, but again, so on, on, so on that hand, therefore, it's perhaps or likely less dangerous unless the levels are orders of magnitude above that. Um, but it is an emerging field of research and um, you know, there's, there's definitely some unknowns there. Have you looked at any of the toxins in shellfish tissue? And if so, how do you determine the level? Because you mentioned oysters, and we definitely have oysters in many of our ponds here, and they're an important part of our community. Um, yes, and so we have been looking at microcystins, uh, we have a project looking at microcystins in shellfish in general. Uh, and in oysters, for that we use uh, definitely LCMS, local chromatograph mass spectrometer. Uh, the interferences associated with the ELISA make that uh, an unreliable approach for, for that analysis. And uh, there are examples of microcystins showing up in some filter feeding bivalves, certainly uh, on the West Coast um, and in the, uh, the Gulf Coast. Um, uh, and we're exploring it now. Um, on, on Long Island and other places, uh, including as well as the Hudson River. Um, 
Um, so st stay tuned for the, uh, those results. We are just thinking about how to set up a monitoring program um, on the vineyard and how to work together to do that effectively. If you were to give us some sage advice um, to start, what would you tell us? What's the, um, as a community? Um, you know, like I said, in New York State, the, this BB4 probe is sort of the gold standard. Um, and it's a, uh, so that's, you know, a useful device, I think. Um, Beyond that, uh, you know, there's probably other similar devices that give you similar answers. Um, you, know, you might want, like I said, we, we feel good about the numbers we're getting because they're cross calibrated with the manufacturer in Germany and across multiple labs in New York State. Um, uh, but at least those sorts of measurements give you a general sense of the amount of uh, cyanobacteria in a water body. Um, so that's a good way to start. And, um, you know, I think linking up with a lab that can make some more uh, detailed measurements is, um, you know, of, of value in, in the event you think there is a problematic, uh, you know, water body. Um, and again, sometimes your eyes can be a good, uh, uh, can at least tip you off as to a water body that might be problematic. Okay. Um, so, we talked a bit earlier about actions to reduce harmful um, algal blooms. Um, which particular, uh, so you talked about remediation in terms of reducing sizes, uh, types of nutrients, improving flushing. Um, one, that question came up again, so I'm just uh, bringing that up. Um, and which toxins, and you mentioned that might, is it tr true that microcystin is the toxin you're most concerned about or are, is anatoxin A equally of concern to you? Um, where in your rankings are the sort of the things that are the biggest um, impact on human health? Yeah, I mean, the neurotoxins like anatoxin A and saxotoxin would be more concerning. Um, you know, a man died in Alaska from saxotoxin poisoning uh, just this July. So, um, you know, that's certainly of a concern. Um, but again, those, those toxins are much rarer compared to microcystin. Okay. So, you know, in some ways you need to know more about your water body. Um, you know, we have found different, you know, beyond microcystin, we've found at times and places things. We have found anatoxin on Long Island. We have found cylinders from opsin. We have found saxotoxin, uh, but a lot less frequently than we do uh, uh, microcystin. This has been incredibly helpful. If anyone has more questions, please feel free to put them in the chat function right now because we're, I think, mostly caught up on our long list of questions, which I am shocked. I can't believe how many questions you answered in just over an hour. Um, let's see. Um, any other questions? Or you might have you might have filled everyone's brains up so much they can't produce any more questions. I think that might be good, but I just wanted to thank you so very much for providing perspective and for being here with our community as we figure out the next steps of monitoring. Um, we're really grateful for your help. And thank you also, Sarah um, Davison, for joining us and for providing information from your sister pond that's dealing with similar things. We're getting a bunch of thank yous for your time. So thank you. Thank you very much. much. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Nice to uh, see everybody. And to, uh... Uh, share the information. All right. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.